Hi, everybody, and welcome to And They Walked Away 5. I'm Steve Evans. You know, we produce this video to entertain and amaze you, but also we see it as a tribute to the men and women that design and build race cars safer every year, to the rules makers, the safety equipment manufacturers, and the men and women of all the emergency units at tracks all over the country that respond so quickly and so bravely. In the next two hours, you're going to see drag racing, hydroplanes, AMA motorcycles, we've got NASCAR, Dave Reef will be along with some sprint car footage you won't believe, and Army Armstrong with Monster Truck Madness. So let's not waste another second. Here it comes, and they walked away five. One thing about an NHRA Pro Stock car, the action isn't always over when they cross the finish line. As he gains found out here in the near lane at the Winter Nationals in 1995. Watch the red, white, and blue car. Everything looks okay till the chute comes out. Doink. As if one side wasn't enough. Another thing I can tell you about NHRA Pro Stock cars, if they get just a few degrees out of shape, get out of it. Even God can't say one of these things, as Brad Klein found out in Richmond, Virginia in 95. Brad Klein is a psychiatrist in real life, and after this, he had himself on the couch. Here's a look from another angle, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He just stayed with it too long. He freely admitted that after the incident. Amazingly enough, that car was repaired in a couple of days. Well, Brad, if you bought the tape, we hate to do this to you, but one more look, real time. He fought the good fight, but to no avail. Maple Grove, Pennsylvania, 1995. Paul Rebeshi in the far lane. We've seen one incident caused by overdriving, another by possibly a parachute. Watch this past the finish line. Oops. Maybe shouldn't got on the brakes quite that hard. Now, if that crash didn't look spectacular to you in real time, watch it in replay. There's the tire smoke, and suddenly, we have liftoff. Whoa! There isn't a pro stock driver around that hasn't had some kind of an incident. These cars are the most difficult in drag racing to drive, no question about it. You want another angle? We have another angle. See right there, the rear wheels have completely stopped turning. You can't do that with these big slicks. The car just has a mind all of its own. Save the radiator. Pomona, California, 1995. The near lane is Doug Kirk. And again, you see a parachute-induced accident that almost took out Jerry Ekman. Boy, that was close. This is Englishtown, New Jersey, 1995. Butch Abbott in the Bondo car near Lane. Abbott would become a poster boy for his sponsor. It took more than Bondo, actually, to heal that one. More embarrassment than anything else for Butch Abbott. Why am I hanging upside down in this car? Please, let there be no video. Sorry, Butch, there's lots of video, including this angle. Have I taken it too far? I believe so. Don't let it get upside down. I talked to Butch right after the incident. Butch Abbott getting his blood pressure tested. It's gotta be up a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure it's up a little bit. What was your sensation in the car? You tried your darndest to keep it off the fence. Yeah, I thought I had it under control, and then when it when it smacked the uh, wall real hard, it kind of threw me around, and that's, that's when I didn't have any steering. 
and it's a shame because you were having one of your best days of racing ever. Yeah, I really thought it was, you know, luck was with me, and then all of a sudden now it's the worst it's been in my career. Well, you can still smile, and that's a sign of a champion. Yeah, thank you. Seattle, Washington, 1996. Bob Glidden was in the far lane, but that's not the car you want to watch. It's the gum out special in the near lane, and Terry Adams right there, moisture under the rear tires, indefensible when that happens. Terry was a passenger. Safety Safari, as always, right there. They were delighted to find out he was okay. They went back to shut off the electrical system at the rear of the car. All the machines are required to have that on the exterior of the automobile. Another look. Something goes wrong mechanically. And under the rear tires goes water, oil, whatever it is. With those great big rear Goodyear slicks, these cars don't slide like a Winston Cup car. Plus, they're very soft. Anytime you kick anything but a straight line, you're going to have your hands full. Thanks to a stout roll cage, arm restraint, seat belts, helmet, he was just fine. Jim Van Dyke and the safety safari checked him out. Not a scratch. Same could be said for the car, however. All right, it is Tom Hammonds. Yes, that's right, the NBA's Tom Hammonds. In his new career as a pro stock driver, he did a heck of a job of trying to save that car. For a rookie driver, that was a darn good effort. Same result, but hey, we'll give him an E for the effort. Another look, Hammonds in the far lane. This was Maple Grove, Pennsylvania, 1996, and the reflexes of an athlete. Look how close he actually comes to making this work. And imagine inside that car, Hammonds is six foot 11. Well, that took care of the front clip. Well, this car was a mess. His beautiful transporter had nothing but junk in it when he left Pennsylvania. One more time. Hammonds right there, he knows he's dropped right here. I thought maybe he's gonna do the impossible. Nope. And as soon as that left tire digs, it's over. And he thought he got mugged by Shaquille O'Neal. It took more than the hot tub for his aches and pains the next morning. Tom Hammonds, they finally extricated him out of the car, and that took a while, actually. Look how long this guy is. But he promised to return to NHRA drag racing as soon as he retired from basketball. Yeah, this uh, 1320 slam dunk was all Hammonds need to convince him that uh, this is something you need to pay a lot of attention to full time. Okay, let's right now a change of pace. We'll go to Army Armstrong with some aquatic action. Well, Steve, you know water can hold some horsepower too, and there's a group of bandoleros that travel around the country racing boats on water. A lot of people like to call these guys the turbines of terror. Some people call them unlimited hydroplanes. Me, I just call them magnificent young men and their flying machines. Check this out. 1995 San Diego Bay Fair. Jeff Hanauer working the inside lane to perfection in the final heat. He's got the ideal situation, but on the outside, the smoking Joe starts to make a move on him. Hanauer going into the corner, hooks a rut. The right sponson digs in, and he is upside down. The boat literally destroyed. Now, this presented 16 seconds of drama where everyone was holding their breath. Hanauer, even though he was encapsulated, nobody knew where he was or what his status was. If you keep an eye to the left of your screen, you're going to notice a helmet bobbing up and down. This is a tribute to the safety equipment as Hanauer indeed did survive this awful crash. You can see him moving around to the left of your screen now. But Chip was encapsulated in the capsule that was designed by his mentor, Bernie Little. And a lot of people say that's what saved his life in this incident. Hanauer was working the inside lane. Everything was going his way. Let's again take a look at this and see if we can kind of figure out what it was. As a rule, air will play a major role here. See if the boat stays down. No, you can see a little bit of air getting underneath the sponson. It rocks it over to the right, digging in the right sponson. Now he is literally just along for the ride. Another view of the incident that took place in the 1995 San Diego Bay Fair. You notice the right side of the boat got up. When it came down, it literally dug in. Han hour at this point in time, like we said, is just along for the ride as the boat digs in. And unlimited hydroplanes have a tendency to disintegrate. 
Even with deep pockets like the Budweiser team, this was a major catastrophe in this sport. Driver Chip Hanauer was fine, acknowledges to the crowd that he is okay, and we had a chance to catch up with boat owner Bernie Little and ask him about the accident. Thank God Chip, Chip, Chip is 100%. He was out in 16 seconds, got out himself, and uh, uh, he's a tough little guy, and he'll be right back there racing. So even with deep pockets and one of the best teams on the circuit, this boat was not to race on this day. Now we go over to San Diego, California, 1996. Mike Hansen in the middle of the screen in the awesome DeWalt Tool Special showed you just how quick you can get in trouble in hydroplane racing. Something broke on the left side of the boat. He hooked and immediately came back to the right. Goes upside down. Again, the big question is, what condition is the driver in? This is gonna give you an opportunity to see the replay of what actually happened is he's making a move and look how close he gets to his competitor. He's running in the second and third lane something had to break on that boat. Now, earlier in the day, they were working on the boat on the sponsor area or the bottom of the boats. The speculation is something was just went astray. Mike's upside down on the boat at this time. It'll give you an opportunity to see exactly how these safety crews work. You're going to see what they do and how they do it. This is a perfect example. If we had a textbook on extracting a driver from a wrecked vehicle, this would be featured in it. The driver's encapsulated with his own oxygen and can breed up to 30 minutes. Safety crew goes on the boat, pulls the bottom hatch off, and you'll see what happens. The driver does come out. Now, you got to remember, each person has their own job. This particular safety crew member's responsibility is the driver. Coming into the picture now, you'll notice another safety crew member. That person's responsibility is to let the advanced safety people know if there's any need for their services. In this case, there was not. Mike was OK. Now they're going through the basic, how many fingers do I have? How do you feel? What happened? I think Mike was the one that asked the question, what happened this time? But he stands up, acknowledges the crowd that he is okay in San Diego Bay. Dave Vilwalk with Pico's American Dream went into the qualifying session in Seattle 1996 with big hopes, trying to get away from the new boat blues. That was not the case. At this point, it was a new boat. Now it's not. The Pico team had to go back to the drawing board. And then we went down to Phoenix, Arizona at Fireberg Lake, one of the tightest courses in unlimited racing. The drivers have to set the boats up so tight to make the corners here. Well, that's not always the case as the Miss T Plus shows you exactly what happens. Steve David literally parallel parks at the top end of the track. We're gonna look at it through a replay and I want you to notice to the left side, the pylons. As the boat goes down the backstretch, now we're on board, but watch the pylons off to your left. That's what the driver's gonna be setting the boat up to do. Something on the bottom of the boat breaks not digging into the water, not letting the vehicle turn. Again, the pylon's off to your left, keep an eye. Now you're drifting off to the right. It's like sliding across a slick grass at this point. Steve David knows that he has got a major, major problem. It's all gonna end on the banks, the beach. The T-Plus did not sustain that much damage, and the $20,000 props in the bottom of the boat were not hurt that bad. As a matter of fact, they were able to race in this event. This is one of those cases where something actually looked worse than it was. Our Steve Montgomery had a chance to catch up with Steve to get his version of it. Steve, first of all, you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Just a little uh, bruised up and looking forward to getting the boat back together so we can go racing. Your fellow drivers might have a little razzing to do over your parking job here. Tell us what happened. Well, I tried to parallel park, and as you can see, I missed the spot. Ken Muscatel, one of the privateer owner drivers at the Tri-Cities event in 1995, gets a little bit of a lift, a whole lot of a lift, too much lift, in the computers and applications boat. He was okay, the name of the tape, as they walked away. Put Ken on the side for a little bit, but he'll be back another time and another day. You'll notice how the slow go at this point in time, he just starts to get a little bit of lift. Sponson walk, meaning the boat going to the left or right. Now, even if he backs on the throttle at this point, the turbine will not back down. He knows he is committed. He's gonna hit the water in the worst possible way. So the good doctor from the Seattle area, even though he's only in his fourth year of unlimited hydroplane racing, just may have experienced his most memorable hydroplane event. 
Now we're going over to Detroit, to the granddaddy of them all, the Detroit Gold Cup. Been there, done that. Keep an eye on Chip Hanauer and Mark Tate as they get together under the notorious bridge turn. Hanauer was on the inside. Tate sitting on his hip on the right side. The helicopter shows us both boats survived the incident, but neither one in good shape. Replay comes up on the screen. Hanauer catches air and literally rolls over the top of Tate in the Smoking Joe's boat, tearing off the top of Tate's canopy. Speaking of tearing off the top of the canopy, when Hanauer landed, he landed flat smack on his canopy and literally disintegrated it. Now we go to the helicopter view, and you're looking at the lanes. Remember, boat racing drivers had the lanes. I don't know who's right and who's wrong here. Tate pinching him in. Chip's trying to move to the outside. Now Mother Nature comes in, catches the front of the Budweiser boat, gets air underneath it, and he is flying around. Now watch where the boat lands. I said flat smack, that's right there. Hanauer goes into the water head first, and very luckily the boat flips back over and lands on its sponsor because the top of the boat is literally gone. You can have all the air in there you want, but when you got water floating around with you, you're in trouble. And Hanauer looking around, dazed. As a matter of fact, he came back later and said he does not even remember this incident. Keep in mind, this is the man that is only four races away from being the winningest driver in the sport. He has not raced since this event. Bernie Little, the winningest owner in the sport, and the man that brought the safety capsule that just may have saved Chip's life, Receive word his driver is okay. Now his concern goes over to the other team for the other driver. What's the condition of our competitor? Well, ironically, Mark Tate is in good shape with a big smile on his face, but you can see the physical damage done to that F-16 canopy we've been talking to you so much about. How are they gonna get him out? The canopy won't open from the top. Remember earlier we showed you how they extract the drivers from the bottom of the boat? Well, it looks like you don't have to be upside down in water for that procedure to work. Two of the fiercest drivers in the boat world come out of their vehicles, one standing up and walking away, that being Hanauer, but Tate has to come out the safety hatch. Our Steve Montgomery caught up with him to see his response. You want to talk? I will talk. How do you feel? feel absolutely fine. Uh, that's the funniest way I ever thought I'd come out of an escape hatch. What did you see happen? Well, I was kind of, you know, holding my lane through the turn, and all of a sudden I saw Bud it just out of the corner of my eye where he got high, and all of a sudden he just started coming across and his sponsor and hit right at the left hand uh, side of the cockpit and he went right over the top of me. Thanks Army. NHRA's model since the early 50s has been dedicated to safety. In this funny car segment you'll see it's more true today than ever. Pomona, California 1995. Mark Oswald in the in and out burger car. Mark is in and wants out. A very bad oil fire. He's on the fire bottles just wants to get that car stopped. Obviously he had no vision or he would not have crossed that center line. Fortunately his opponent, Ray Higley, had long since cleared him. Safety safari right there. Let's have another look. Watch the top of Oswald's motor. This thing exploded so violently it probably hydraulic. Not only did the supercharger come loose from the manifold, but the heads lifted off, might have put the rods out. Every bit of oil and some of the fuel is feeding this fire. Mark has been through many incidents, has always walked away, and we hope he always does. This one had us scared, because with the cars going that slowly, there's a potential for burns. But he was okay. A Little bit of smoke inhalation, a quick hit of oxygen, took care of that. Topeka, 1995, Whit Bazemore, very similar incident, Bar Lane. The fuse only a few hundred feet long. But this time, the blower concussion was so strong it unlatched the body and blew it away. Witt no longer has the firewall to protect him. But he was okay. In drag racing, you find out who the good drivers are when things go wrong. Pay attention to Bazemore. Watch the front wheels. He has to be stunned. His vision impaired. He's running in his own oil. But watch him drive this car. Steering into the slide as you would on ice or snow. Magnificent job by Whit Bazemore to keep that car up the fence. Safety safari on the way. Okay, let's pick this up. Indianapolis, Indiana, watch the far lane. Tony Pendragon, Larry Miner's Geronimo car. Sands body. That was the altitude record for the season, no question about it on the body lift. Tony quickly out of the car. Safety safari there to take care of him. 
a little bit dazed, had his bell rung. That was a real boomer. Very much like a cannon shot. And understand, in situations like this, the driver usually has no warning. If he does it so quick, there's no response that he can make. Now those bodies are designed to unlatch at the back as that one did. In fact, the body could be snapped right back on the car. But all the systems did their job. The neck color, the Nomex sock, the heavy fireproof boots. Tony Pedregon, A-OK. -okay. Back to the West Coast, the Winston Select Finals 1995. You just saw Tony Pedregon in trouble. Watch the near lane, the McDonald's Pontiac, his older brother Cruz, Ray Higley far side. And by what we call the switchable camera, you saw it explode. The body gone and Cruz, much like Whit Bazemore, did some dirt track driving. Actually, Cruz has experience in midgets and sprints, and he used it all right there. The blower completely gone off of the race car. You gotta have another look at this. Now watch where the body goes. And watch the supercharger. Poor old Ray Higley, budget racer, just trying to hang in there. There you see the rotors out of the supercharger, almost got tangled up with Cruz himself. Where did the body go? Well, it went right into the side of Higley, caving in the right side of his car. Another look from that switchable camera that automatically, when the cars go by, switches to the reverse direction. Watch this. There's the body. Enter screen left, Ray Higley. Watch and listen for the impact on Higley's car. The sound of crunching carbon fiber. The very next race at Pomona, the Chief Winter Nationals, we saw Al Hoffman in the near lane, Mark Sievers far lane, and this one is truly bizarre. Both cars get involved. Mark Sievers suddenly lights up. Hoffman has no idea he's on fire. He sees movement to his left. He thinks he's being waved in to turn off of the racetrack, and all of a sudden, Al turns off okay, right into the side of Sievers. It knocked the right front corner off of Al's car, but Sievers, well, he <laughs> was certainly the worst for wear. As we look head on, that fire you see in the center of the windshield is not inside the car. It's coming up in the little crack between the supercharger, the fuel injector, and the body. Inside the car, not that bad. Oh, there you see the collision. Al was furious. I doubt that Sievers could see anything. No, it's not his fault. Can you fix it? Oh, yeah, we fix it. We got bodies, and they'll fix it. Shay. During the 1996 season, early on, Tom Hoover, the Pioneer Electronics car four lane, had a recurring problem. It's called a wheel stand that unlatches the body, and it turns turtle in the middle of the racetrack, and you're very embarrassed. And you know you're probably going to be in the next end they walked away. Maybe even twice. Here's Hoover at the very next race. Houston Raceway Park. Sets it down after a wheel stand. Body and latches again. That automatically pulls the parachutes out. This time, though, a bit more damage as it broke the left front spindle when it came down and put him into the wall. Hoover's saying, oh, no, I'm going to be the star of, and they walked away. I guarantee you they fixed that problem. We never saw that again in uh, 1996. All right, let's go to the high country. Thunder Mountain, Denver, Colorado. Al Hoffman again, part of an incident, unintentionally. Lynn Soroka, local Rocky Mountains racer, was in the near lane, and boy, he lit him up early and just punched the fence. Now the car has a mind of its own as the throttle is stuck. It gets wedged between the injector and the body. Now the body is gone, but you can see the butterflies are still open about a half of an inch, and it wants to run on what field is remaining in the lines. And Len is saying, oh man, everybody's watching me. All my friends are here, the television cameras are, this is awful. Got this pigeon-toed funny car. And he finally got it stopped. He was just fine. Did take a pretty hard hit, though. We saw a race uh, not too many years ago at this very same track where the driver was unconscious and uh, a much worse incident happened. Topeka, 1996. Watch Jim Epler, a less than auspicious debut with a brand new Winnebago car. Oh, 
broken oil line, moisture under the rear wheels. Jim at least kept it off the right-hand wall. The first time in his long career he had ever, ever hit the fence. It had some fires and some other incidents, but never hit an immovable object. He was, however, back, believe it or not, for the very next race, new body and all. All right, it's time for some sprint car action, and who would know more about him than Dave Reap? As you've already seen, the world of motorsports isn't always blue skies and sunshine, and that's especially the case on the nation's dirt tracks when you talk open wheel racing. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Reef, and when you say the word sprint car, the question isn't if you'll get upside down, but when and how hard. Put 24 of these cars on a little quarter-mile bullring, the fine line gets even finer. Put them on a big half-mile oval with speeds approaching 150 mile an hour in the straightaways, and there's no room for air. Fortunately, though, technology dictates these cars get safer each and every season. And that's certainly good news because open wheel race cars can and do get upside down. But fortunately, those rollovers sometimes are soft. Case in point at the Knoxville Raceways, the 55 car, Lyle Howe III tips it over. Nice and easy, nice and soft in turn number one. The gas spilling out on the racetrack, not a problem. Safety crews take care of that right away. As we see again, Howe enters the turn, gets a bit out of shape. Mike Ranke in that 0-2 car, helping him out just a little bit. When the 55 car's left rear digs in, it's a nice, soft, gentle rollover onto that $400 aluminum wing, easily replaced. A third look, you see Ranke coming to the tail end, and that's all it takes. Lyle Howe the third takes a nice, soft, gentle rollover. But sometimes those rollovers aren't so soft. Case in point, Lance Blevins, again at the Knoxville Raceway, entering the back stretch. Blevins gains contact with the wall hard. Up and down, left and right, all around. Blevins definitely getting the racing education the hard way. Remember, this is a 17-year-old in his senior year of high school from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and this is a very tough way to go out of the Knoxville Nationals. You see the front axle coming off, the wheels coming off, the wing taking the brunt of the force, and the roll cage does exactly what it's supposed to do, sheltering Blevins from the blow. Our camera three angle, you see him in the back stretch gaining contact again. There are pieces and parts flying everywhere. For these drivers, all they feel is bump, bump, air, bump, bump. They can't wait for this ride to stop. And for Lance Blevins, that took a little while. Leonard Lee also involved in the 16L car, but Blevins walks away. Our Ralph Shaheen was at the racetrack and talked to a very shaken Lance Blevins. I don't think I've ever seen a sprint car torn up that bad, but you walked away okay. What went on as you were flipping inside? What were you thinking? Just hang on and, you know, hope it ends soon because it was rough. It took a long time. The car's torn up, but as you can see, Lance Blevins was able to walk away. Next up, Joe Gertie on the Knoxville Nationals qualifying night. Gertie, the quick time driver and a good shot at the A main until trouble happens in turn number two. Gertie goes up and over in the 3G car during his heat race. You see Gertie coming now in the yellow car, already in trouble, spun around. A little help from the 461 car, Lance DeWeese. Gertie goes up and over. Who's next at the sprint car capital of the world? Why, it's Leonard Lee and Dan Hamilton Sparks flying out of the 15X. And once again, a reminder why open wheel race cars should never, never touch. Ever wonder what it's like to drive a sprint car? Well, you're on board now with World of Outlaw driver Andy Hillenberg. Oh, ho, ho. while Andy stays upright, Jerry Richard Jr. takes the tumble. How tough is sprint car racing? We'll put $100,000 on the line and watch out. The orange 55 machine about to take flight is Craig Delansky. He goes up and over, shedding tires, shedding Nerf bars. All kinds of parts coming off of the 55 car. I mentioned $100,000. This is the start of the 1995 Knoxville Nationals A main. And there you see Delansky getting all out of shape. The tail tank even comes off. And check out the tire right over top of the World of Outlaws, Steve Kinzer. Delansky, though, was able to walk away. One more look. Take a look at the launching pad. The Fourbrook 5 car driven by Johnny Herrera. Delansky with nowhere to go. Tries to thread the needle and ends up becoming the haystack. There you see a front torsion bar coming out, the front left tire. 
bouncing all over the place. Fortunately, Delansky and everyone else in this accident was able to walk away. Well, now we turn the tables to 1996, where it's been a really tough year for the King of the Outlaws, Steve Kinzer. In an all Kinzer front row, Mark provides the launch pad as Steve takes the wild ride. The tail tank, front axle, it all goes over the top of the fence. And as I said, Kinzer, 1996, a very tough year. This was just the beginning. But as you can see from the crumpled wreckage, out crawls the King of the Outlaws, Steve Kinzer. And needless to say, this Maxim chassis totally destroyed, but fortunately, the body is in one piece. Kins are able to crawl into the backup car and do it all again. As I mentioned, at the start of the race, the two Kinzer cousins gain contact. Steve bites the front left into the dirt at Eldora, pitches the front. Actually, you notice the sparks as it hits the top of the fence. That's the wing also going over, the hood going over, and the parts flying everywhere. Fortunately, though, as we mentioned, Steve Kinzer had a backup car and crawled back into the car the next night. How powerful are sprint cars? 800 horsepower plus, good enough to do a monster wheel standing. End your night the hard way. Stevie Smith in the Echo Water 71 with the big wheel stand. From there, there's nowhere to go. Only the ground at the top of your roof and the wall provide the cushion as Stevie Smith's night in the Echo Water 71M is done. Remember the king? I'm talking about a bad year, and it continues on this night at the Beaver Dam Raceway. Hopping the cushion, Kinzer tips it over again two times around, finally ending up on his side. Sammy Swindell, one of the original outlaws, still on the trail, but on this night, the trail gets the best of Sammy. Ugh! Nose first into the dirt. They call them wing warriors, right? You think maybe they could fly? Oh, they can fly. Jack Howdenshile takes a wild ride down the front stretch at the Eldora Speedway. Ed Lynch also becomes involved as does Bobby Davis. The four car starts it all off. Hot, heavy on the throttle, has nowhere to go, right into the side of Ed Lynch. And from there, the 22 car gains some serious altitude. Sammy Swindell also involved in the Hooters one car, gaining contact with the inside of the fence. And Ed Lynch, a crumpled mess, everyone walks away. How about a double whammy after getting upside down? Kevin Huntley hopes everyone misses him, but Mark Kinzer hits him right in the side. Ouch, what a way to go out. I'm talking about going out the hard way. Watch the end of the USAC midgets here at the Copper World Classic. Davey Hamilton trying to race with Danny Drynan. The two gain contact, Hamilton hits the wall and then crosses the track in front of John Starks. Nice job of missing the accident, but he ends up coming across and there's a whole fleet of cars, boom! Nowhere to go. John Sarno ends up on pit lane, exiting the race early. It all starts when Davey Hamilton tries to race with Danny Drynan coming for the checkered flag. Hamilton gains a little contact with the left rear tire of Drynan in the 33 car, and Hamilton is on his way for a ride to the inside retaining wall at PIR. The seven car then begins a gentle climb across the mid portion of the racetrack. And with a whole host of other track travelers coming behind him, it's John Starks who tries to thread the needle to the outside of Hamilton. The right front part of the suspension is heavily damaged. Starks car is uncontrollable. From there, he crosses back down across the racetrack with the checkered flags waving. There's a whole host of people just trying to get by, but unfortunately, not everyone is gonna get by. John Sarno's gonna take a wild ride, boom up and over the wall onto the pit lane. As the checker flags at PIR, there was definitely some excitement there. I think he just wanted to get out of the race earlier. That's just my personal assessment of the whole deal. Well, let's move now back to the dirt, back to the Knoxville race. We a whiz-bang start to the 1996 Amico Knoxville Nationals E-Main event, found a traffic jam off turn number four. Tommy Scott flipping violently. Robert Jackson also involved, taking down one of the poles on the infield. Judy Bates, bunch of cars involved. As they come off turn four, you see two cars go nose first into the wall. Just like at PIR, the whole bunch of other cars, no place to go. That's Tommy Scott barrel rolling in the 4S car. Robert Jackson taking down the pole in the 2AU car. 
Sid Blanford out of Vail, Colorado, also involved in the B&B excavating car. And as you can see, it's sometimes a little bit of a challenge to crawl out of a broken and battered race car, but Blanford able to walk away. He took two years off before that accident there. Tommy Scott in the 4S car, safety officials right on top of the thing. The people at Knoxville, some of the best fire and rescue crew you'll find across the nation is Scott now out of the race car. And well, he, he might have a TV interview coming up. I might want to check your hair, uh, Tom. Your hair, it's a little bit, there you go. Nicely done. Same race with a D main. A D for Dion. Look out, turn left. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. Dion Hindi up and over off of turn number one at the Knoxville Raceway. And a flat tire rolling by as well. Hindi, though, you see, already moving around in the racetrack. The roll cage doing exactly what it's supposed to as Hindi sheds the belts and climbs out onto the Knoxville dirt. Hindi walking away from the wild ride in turn number one. A frustrating event for Hindi, who's trying to run with the outlaws on a full-time basis, but not very good on this night. Again, a look, Dion Hindi, the meat in the sandwich between two cars, and he kind of gets squeezed out the backside. And with nowhere to go, it's the turn one wall that greets him with a big, how you doing, Hindi? Take a look at this race car breaking apart all parts, except, of course, the roll cage, which precisely does his job. There's some fire involved as well. Some fuel gets backed up into the headers. And then it's a nice spinning roll that seemingly never ends for these drivers. It always seems like it goes quick to us, but just ask a driver. It seems like these things go on forever. From high above the turn one platform, we take another look, and you can see Hindi kind of getting pushed outward toward the wall by the inside car. Hindi gains contact very, very hard. And I guarantee that young man from Albuquerque, New Mexico is going to be feeling that one in the morning. Bumps and bruises all over the body as the parts just fly off of the number 11 Hindi Racing Enterprises car. The J&J &J chassis, as we mentioned, though, doing exactly what it's supposed to is the front axle, the rear axle. There's not too many parts of this car they're going to be able to salvage. From the Sprint Car Hall of Fame, it looks no different. Same accident, same for getting to turn left, and same results. The Hindi Racing Enterprises car buckles hard into the turn one fence. Gives you a good angle at the rear axle being knocked out of the race car. The front axle going to take a hit right here. And eventually, the 11 car will finally come to a rest on his side. Dion Hindi, a tough break, trying to run with the world of outlaws. Remember our good buddy Steve Kinzer in the bad year of 1996? Well, on this night, it's Steve who gets to watch the accident. Trouble in turn number two. That's Greg Hodnett in the Cell Michelle car number 11. But as you can see, he's already working on the belts. He's going to crawl out of the top of the race car as the chassis again does its job. And speaking of jobs, Hodnett out of Memphis, Tennessee, does have an engineering degree, but chooses instead to drive a race car. Kind of wonder why after an accident like this. But you can see Hodnett working to the top side of the racetrack. He sees a couple cars get squirrely in front of him. That forces him to get out of the gas. He hops the cushion and then touches the wall. That's all you need to do in an open wheel sprint car to have a result like this. Just touch the wall a little bit. On board, take a look and listen as we ride with Greg Hodnett. All right, let's move on to Charlotte, 1995. Johnny Benson gets out of shape, comes up across the racetrack in the 74 car, and boom, Kenny Wallace has absolutely nowhere to go. On fire, takes it into the grass. All in all, about six cars suffered damage on this day at Charlotte. You want to see a hard hit, though? Let's go to Rockingham, North Carolina, Beachy in race. Oh. This is Jimmy Hensley, the 32 car. Gets loose. Spins around, comes up the track. Here comes Greg Sachs. Just as Hensley gets spun around. Trying to find a place to go and kaboom. Almost puts the car on its nose. 
a testimony to the fuel cells in these cars. They're mounted in that trunk area, and it did its job, and there could have been a nasty fire or explosion. One more angle. It's difficult to say in a crash like this which driver takes the most strain, in the front or in the back. I personally don't want to be in either one of them. Greg Sachs was a bit shook up. He went to the infield care center, as they all must, but first a wave to his fans that he was okay and wanted to make sure his hair looked good when he got there. Winston Cup at Charlotte, 1996. That's Johnny Benson, the number 30 Pennzoil car. Sideways trying to find a place to go. You saw the fans' reaction, actually the pit road reaction, as Benson took a horrible hit from Ricky Craven that literally turned the car inside out. Craven backed his way down the racetrack with significant damage. Both cars taking horrible damage. There's Benson, and here comes Ricky. Oh, man. Benson spins like a top. Horrific damage to both cars. That was a nasty one. Potentially, could have been an injury. Uh-uh. They walked away. Charlotte 96, Kyle Petty was putting a lot of pressure from behind on Ted Musgrave. Musgrave spins out of control up the racetrack. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars. Including Rusty Wallace, who did a triple spin down on the apron. Charlotte, 1995. We saw some classic Earnhardt. He had just passed Jeff Gordon for the lead and suddenly leans on Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip into the wall. Earnhardt nose first in that rare silver anniversary car. Both of them later would have some pretty tense words. If you're an Earnhardt fan or uh, don't particularly care for Ironhead, it won't much matter because I think you'll study these replays for a long, long time. As long as you own this and they walked away tape. Which way did it go? Whose fault was it? There's Gordon down on the inside. He'd just been passed, trying to get back into it. Earnhardt up the racetrack using Daryl Walter for a leaning post, it would appear. Walter did a real good job of not making this thing any worse than it was. Both cars suffered severe damage, but were later back in the race. All right, you want to see it again? By popular demand, the pass has been completed on Jeff Gordon. Okay, who's leaning on who here? Ooh, they bump and run a couple of times. Right now, Walter is saying things a good Christian man probably shouldn't, but the Lord will forgive him. It was Earnhardt. Everybody else heaving a sigh of relief as they get around the two, and also pretty glad that two of the better drivers were out of the race. They didn't have to deal with them for a while. Night racing at Charlotte. Can't beat it. All right, this is even better, because you see the actual pass. Right there, the 24 car, Jeff Gordon. He's in that little sandwich. And here come two of the most competitive drivers ever on a high banked oval. They look over at each other and go, uh-huh, who's going to lead this? A little tap. Waltrip not going to give any ground. But the higher they go up the racetrack, the worse it is for both of them. Kaboom. Woo, nice evasive action by, I believe it was Jeff Bodine and a number of other guys. Night racing at Charlotte, pretty tough to be. And then there's the controversial new concrete track at Dover Downs. This was June of 95. You get one sideways at Dover, you get a lot of them sideways at Dover. You get a lot of them down on the apron too. They just slide down off the monster mile. About a half a dozen cars involved, so we'll have about a half a dozen replays for you. Takes that many to get this one figured out. Look at this, looks like a SIG alert. Feel like a traffic reporter. A lot of controversy about this concrete surface. The drivers have had problems dealing with it, uh, but not nearly as many as Goodyear. And they have maybe not yet quite found the tire that's gonna work here. You'd think whatever works at Bristol would work here. No, Bristol's a half mile. This is a great big track that's been called the Monster Mile even when it was asphalt. Let me tell you, 500 laps of this thing takes a real strong driver and a brave one to boot, as we can see in this incredible accident. Towards the back of the pack, you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of big names. Mark Martin, Terry Labonte, hardly anybody was spared some inconvenience in this deal. 
Also, John Andretti taking some pretty good licks. Here's Jimmy Spencer on the left side of your screen. Spencer, for one of the rare occasions, got out without a whole lot of damage in the Smoking Joe's car. Let's go on board with Mark Martin. in the Kellogg's car with Terry Labonte. What do you do when you see all this trouble in front of you? You try to go low, but sometimes it just doesn't work. John Andretti received a slight leg injury, got a little help. Mark Martin and Terry Labonte exchange insurance information. And right now, we go to Army Armstrong and Monster Truck Madness. Well, Steve, as you well know, not all forms of motorsport take place in the major arenas where they've got the major facilities and millions of people show up and what have you. Sometimes you got to go to some pretty out-of-way places to see what the monsters can do. Speaking of monsters, check this section out on monster trucks, mud racers, and, of course, our friends on the mile of mud, the swamp buggy racers. Monster truck racing is not new to the automotive and truck world, but the type of competition you see this day and time is a lot different from the old grins and giggle type. Drivers having to qualify to get into events, and this is the result. Brian Welt at Lima, Ohio, having a little bit of problem with his vehicle, trying to get just qualified. We're going to show you a replay. I want you to keep an eye on certain things. For example, the attitude of the truck, the height of the truck, and also be aware of the integrity of the roll cage once the vehicle lands. You notice that all four corners have a tendency to help the truck. Brian goes on the throttle immediately knowing he's in trouble. Rule of thumb, if you can get one part of that truck to touch the ground, hit the throttle, it should pull it around. That was not the case for Brian Welch. Beating the odds, the name of the vehicle in the far lane, the driver, Rob Marshall, was trying to do just that. At this point in time, he's in trouble. He should hit the throttle to try to spin the vehicle out. No, too late. It had already rolled over on him. We're going to take it right inside the driver's compartment now, and you can see the integrity of the roll cage held up. All the safety equipment works. Rob Marshall will come out and have an opportunity to acknowledge to the crowd that, yes, indeed, he is okay, and will walk away, and we'll have to wait for another day to race. A mud racer wants to hit the throttle when he's in trouble. What that will do will spin the rear tires and spin the vehicle out. Rob does it, but he's already flipped before he does it. I asked him earlier if he knew that he had waited before the flip. He said, no, I thought I hit it perfect. He didn't hit the gas till right now. But, as we said, he was able to walk away. Rodney Covington comes out with a Chrysler-powered vehicle in the far lane. Same scenario. Keep an eye on him. You got to hit the throttle. He does. Too late. Covington in a violent accident goes end over end, demolishing the vehicle. The Chrysler horsepower here got him in trouble. You can see the driver moving around very gingerly inside the roll cage. Again, to the right side of your screen. Watch when the driver hits the throttle. You need to hit it when you're in trouble to spin the vehicle out. That's not the case here. He is in trouble now. He needs to be on the gas. It'll completely roll. Now he'll hit the throttle. Too little, too late. But Rodney, as his predecessor, walked away. Don't think for a minute that mud racing is not a violent sport. You know, in the sport of mud racing, it don't have to be all these long rails and stuff like that to bring a lot of action to you. As we see here, Peter Gallus will come out. This is from Bluesburg, Pennsylvania in 1996. That's a tall truck, okay, the full body type truck. He too gets into trouble. Slow, not as violent, and not as quick, but the result just the same. We're going to bring up a replay and show you as you can look inside again and see that all the safety equipment works, a little bit of bleed off of the fuel system, but the rut is the story here. You notice he starts off straddling the rut. Now he drops down in the rut, develops a bounce. The right rear tire hooks a rut, and he is going over. So showing that the full-bodied vehicles can have their share of problems at Bloomsburg also. Speaking of Bloomsburg, keep an eye on a far lane. Same lane, same results, but a lot more violent. Dan Brown in a blower drive service vehicle out of Whittier, California, hooked the same rut that the vehicle did in front of him and high sides it. 
We're looking right down the barrel of the gun, if you will. Keep an eye on Brown. See when the vehicle makes a violent move. There, it dropped down on him. Brown is trying to play defense now and pull the vehicle out. The pit's only 180 feet long, but believe me, it's got to be one of the wildest rides in the world. Brown raises his hands to protect himself, even though he has arm restraints and all the safety equipment. That is a natural reflex. He comes to a stop on part of the monster truck course. Speaking of monster trucks, Privateer, Kirk Dabney running hard. Keep an eye on the right rear of this vehicle. It breaks. Dabney's in trouble. He's on the gas trying to throttle up. Now, I don't care where you steer the front. When the back is broken, this is the result you're going to get. And it took his Privateer about a year to come back financially from this devastating accident. I want you to keep an eye on the right rear tire. Again, there's four tires on a vehicle. That one is going in a different direction than the other three at this point. That's why this accident happened. You can see from upside down, the whole rear suspension had disintegrated at this point in time. One thing about a monster truck, it is so big, they've got a lot of space there to absorb the energy, and that's what saved the driver. It did not save the truck. Another sport, South Florida. The only place you're gonna find swamp buggy racing. Mike Fillmore, a guy that does awfully well in the circle track world, comes over to a new world. That's the world of the swamp buggy. Setting on his right, your left is Eddie Cheshire. Fillmore tries to make a move on him, tries to cut the corner off, but doesn't realize there's a thing called a rooster tail with the swamp buggies in it, puts him literally on his head. And unlike the unlimited hydroplanes where you have a safety capsule with assisted breathing, that's not the case here. In this sport, you better be holding your breath. Some of the spectators coming over, the safety crew coming over, Mike's laying upside down in water. He's under about... 30 inches of water right now as the safety crew is trying to get him back out. Mike, who normally campaigns on the local bull rings and asphalt and dirt racing tracks, just ventured over into swamp buggy racing. I wonder if he's questioning that decision right now, because this is not a positive first experience. The replay is going to show us where Mike literally rides up on Eddie Chester's rooster tail. Now, you can't rub in this sport. You got to give the guy a little bit of room. Mike did not do it. Guarantee in the future he will. Taking a look at him from reverse angle, you can't even see Mike. Now look at the speed he has coming into the corner. He hooks that rooster tail and now starts to bicycle the vehicle as he goes over. The left front wheel has already collapsed. Mike better be holding his breath. One of the latest phenomena in the motorsporting world and of motorsporting events is for the spectators to actually participate. In this case, it's called tough truck racing. The producer sets up an obstacle course, the big tires, the finish line, boom, and it gives the spectators a chance to come out of the crowd and to show off a little bit, get their 15 minutes of fame. In this case, it looks like the body shop is the one that's gonna benefit from the exposure received. This particular vehicle looks like a daily driver. He drove it in. I don't think he's gonna be driving it home, though. Then we get over to the monster truck world. A lot of people wonder about team racing. How hard do teammates race each other? We found out out exactly. It's the two Bigfoot teams of Dan Runty on the left of your screen and Eric Meager were racing head to head. Look what happens. The Bigfoot driver on the throttle, upside down, flips it end over end. The crowd was at a loss due to the dusty conditions. Runty, we understand, is okay. The safety crew runs in to see what happens. Keep an eye on the right rear of the vehicle. Monster trucks, that seems to be the weak link because as Runty prepares to go to the second jump, the truck is out of shape. See, it's sideways. He's steering to go forward. Now watch the right rear tire. Bam, it digs in. There's only four pounds of air in these tires. When that tire hit that hard, Runty was in trouble. He tries to get on the gas to pull it back in. Not the case, it's not gonna work. With only four pounds of air in the left tire, it collapses the sidewall and rolls him end over end over end. Don't ever doubt that these guys are real racers. They are. Again, stop action comes out and shows you the impact right there of the right rear tire. Now, Runty knows he has got to get on the throttle to try to pull the truck back in. That left rear tire with only four pounds of air, it collapses on him. He is in big trouble now. Not just Bigfoot, it's big trouble here.
Garland Walls comes out in a little deuce coupe. The Beach Boys sing about it. He likes to drive it. It was Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, one of the most violent wrecks I have an opportunity to see. Walls in the lane closer to us comes out, hooks the vehicle in the high side and starts a series of rolls going into the Yodok barriers. And remember in the past, if you follow motorsporting, everybody knows about the infamous Bloomsburg wall. Tag, it scored again. Wall survived the crash with minimal damage. The car, as you can see, was completely destroyed. The big question was, why did the wreck even happen? The track had actually been moved away. Did you see the driver moving around as the safety crew comes over to him to check with him? The track angle had actually been moved away from the wall. We've had many of accidents at Bloomsburg. They've all taken place at this one point. Walls on the left of your screen comes out. Now notice how his vehicle will make a move here to the right. Then he high sides it. So he's in trouble before he ever gets to that wall. The left front tire came off. The Yodok safety barriers filled with water actually did exactly what they were supposed to do. They kept him out of the electrical substation and kept him back in the confines of the track itself. Another view shows Garland left the starting line looking awfully good in the beautiful little X1R sponsor Little Deuce Coupe. But when he comes out the end, for some reason, this vehicle makes a move to the right instead of the left. That's where the trouble started. But again, it started way before he hit that wall. And ladies and gentlemen, that is impact, that is violence. But again, the safety equipment worked for it. The roll cage sustained itself. And the driver walked away. And Garland, one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet in any form of motorsport, walked away. However, we can't say the same thing for his vehicle because before he goes back to the starting line, there is a lot of work to be done here. And once again, the infamous Bloomsburg Wall collects another mud racer. Okay, thank you, Army. You know, motorcycle racers rate right up there with rodeo cowboys. Their tolerance for pain is unbelievable. Mike Hill in Road Atlanta, a 600cc Supersport bike, pitched him off in the grass. He just kind of shrugged it off. Sears Point, Sean Higby, Supercross, down all by himself, just lost the front end and lost his motorcycle. Take another look at this. All the braking power on these bikes is on that front wheel. And right there, he just flat lost it. But I tell you, they do know how to tumble, almost like acrobats. Where's my bike? Then there was Charlotte, nowhere do you go faster. Coming off the banking, headed into turn number one. Mike Smith lost it, his motorcycle chased him down and tried to crush him within the hay bales unsuccessfully. Scott Gray, Sears Point in the Super Twin class. Again, a single rider incident. Safe at home for Scott Gray. Sears Point again, Joe Winston. Super Twin bike just got the wobbles and lost that front end. Here again, gets into what some riders would call a tank slapper. Using that right knee as a rudder. A lot of brake on the front wheel and right there, oh no, that's why they call it a tank slapper, right there. Okay, Joe Winston, he was okay. Hay bales and tires may seem crude, but they do the job just about every time. Nothing more exciting than AMA Grand National action on the Sacramento Mile. Ooh, remember what I told you about the tolerance for pain? Nothing like getting thrashed by your own motorcycle, then being unable to walk on the slick track in your steel shoe. That's embarrassment. Don Estep also on the Sacramento Mile. Estep number 14. Trying to execute the pass, got right in the rear wheel of the competition, and he goes for a slide for life. Whoa, one more look at this one. This is Olympic stuff. At least the motorcycle got away from him. There's a lot of padding underneath those leathers, even where you can't see it on their backs, all over. He's okay. Troy Corser, the young Australian who won the 1995 AMA Superbike title. This was at Sears Point. One of America's most beautiful racetracks, and the Australian was off hard. And that's where the plastic protection along the spine 
pays off big time. Still at Sears Point, Ray Yoder Jr., number three. Into the fence. And they just seem to know how to tumble, how to get their arms and legs all organized. He's okay. Rich Oliver. No faster racetrack than Brainerd, Minnesota, the 250 GP class. He's off it. And right curb service for Rich Oliver. Larry Pegram, they call him the worm on number six. Dirt track racer, also AMA superbike racer. Aha, yes. Give me my bike. That didn't hurt. All right, Tom Kipp, one of the great ones in superbike competition. This at Laguna Seca, Northern California. Oh, should have turned right when he turned left. He too into the bales. And look at it, how anxious they are to do it again. That's what amazes me. AMA Supercross at Daytona, the birthplace of the sport. Jeremy McGrath, John Dowd. That's Jeremy, the number one Honda plate. This was at the very start of the race where anything can happen if you don't get a perfect start. And even uh, the great one, Jeremy McGrath, can have a problem. Here he gets together with John Dowd. Oh, and Dowd definitely takes the worst of it there. Jeremy naturally came from behind and won. Let's take one more look, head on. Watch the 14 bike, that's John Dowd. He's off hard. Jeremy actually bails to protect Dowd. Dowd hoping the field doesn't use him for traction. Still at Daytona, number 19, Michael Craig, number nine, Ryan Hughes, not enough real estate for two motorcycles. That kind of thing happens all the time in Supercross. Woo! Runaway motorcycle, shoot that thing. No, actually it was trying to make the pass. Number nine, Ryan Hughes, that got into the back of 19, Michael Craig. I'm not gonna lay any blame. These guys work too hard. 125, snarly little rascal, still at Daytona, James Dobb. Oh man, that motorcycle was every which way but loose. On the quarter mile dirt track in Daytona, number 42, Steve Moorhead gets in trouble. Off the bike, he thinks he'll just slide it out. Not a chance. Matt Waite, number 95, hit his bike and then hit him from another angle. Moorhead, loose. They only race this quarter mile once a year at this distance. Hey, get out of my way. No, it's, this is my dirt. Into the bales. Off he goes. And here comes Waite. He doesn't want to hit Moorhead. Slides it into his motorcycle. Now he hits Moorhead his very own body. Unbelievable. One guy had a separated shoulder, the other raced that same night. Both of them walked away. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the fastest accelerating vehicles in all the world. Top fuel dragster, Sonoma, 1995. Rance McDaniel, the layback car. Suddenly, it's a tricycle on a very difficult track with an uphill shutdown area. Tagged the wall just slightly. Rance did a fantastic job of driving that machine. Not as easy as he made it appear. Now let's go to Indianapolis, 1995. Here is one unlike anything I have ever seen. Wayne Bailey on his burnout, right? Nice smoky burnout. Wait a minute, Wayne, you're, you're not John Fo Wayne, where are you going, Wayne? There was something wrong internally with the fuel system. Feeding it fuel, he put the chute out. That's what I'd have done. Now he's headed for the sand trap. He does something I wouldn't have done. He tries to save the car by avoiding the sand trap out in the grass. That's not a textbook drive, Wayne. Watch out for the woods, Wayne. And finally does get in the sand trap, a rather circuitous route, and it's still running. It starts to look like a tractor pull. The motor finally mercifully digests itself and dies. Safety safari disbelievingly on the scene and they wore Swain's helmet. Oh well. Okay, here we go. This is Topeka 95, Connie Coletta in the near lane. You're gonna see a lot of the Coletta boys, father and son. Connie had a beautiful run going. Suddenly something goes wrong with the motor, a fuel line possibly. A lot of sparks, could be the clutch, could be a lot of things. All in all, Connie had a rather warm rump when it was all over. But Connie wasn't finished with his appearance in, and they walked away five. He'll be back. Meanwhile, here is 
Corey McLeod in far lane, Kenny Bernstein near lane, the 1995 Budweiser Classic, Pomona Raceway. Unbelievable. Simultaneously, Corey Mack blows both rear tires off the car. They have yet to determine what caused that to happen. Their crew, Goodyear, the wheel manufacturer, it is a big, big mystery. It was a mystery to Corey. He's got no radio, he has no rear view mirror. He climbed out of the car and went, what in the heck happened? Gainesville, Florida, final round. Scott Coletta near lane, Blaine Johnson far lane. How bad did Scott want to win this race? Bad enough to not lift. Bad enough to look like a telephone pole mid-track and blow it over backwards. The car was pretty much a total. They tried fixing it, but it was just never the same. But Scott, however, is always the same. Brave and mad. One more look at this. Once they get too high in the air, it gets under them. Those little small wings, instead of providing downforce, provide lift. They don't stand up much straighter than that. They don't come down much harder either. This one kept Murph McKinney busy in his chassis shop in Indiana, and that kept the wing guy in business right there. But Scott was okay. His wife and his family were down there to greet him, and his dad said, why did you do that? I was trying to win the race, Pop. Oh, well. Seattle, Washington. Connick led a near lane. Bob Vandegrift Jr. on the far side, but it's the near lane. You want to watch the Coletta Show. A Roman candle for Connie Coletta. Connie had more of those foreign fires in 1995 and 96 than the rest of the field put together. And you know what? He didn't care. Flat doesn't care. Once again, the Auto Light Nationals in Sonoma. Connie in the near lane. Woo! And a part gets into a tire. Ultimately, both tires. And Connie is on a rather Flappy, floppy ride. The parachute actually did a pretty good job of keeping that car straight. It could have been a lot worse. And the safety safari again on the spot before he could even get out of the car. Seattle, Andy Woods in the far lane. This is in competition up against Shelly Anderson. Shelly smokes the tires and shuts off. Andy's got an easy one. No, he doesn't. A wing support breaks, takes him over the center line. That disqualifies him. He hits a couple of walls in the John Mitchell car. But the safety safari already on their way. The chassis did its job. Even the injector kind of helped protect him. And there you saw front wheel just come zinging by. Let's have one more look. Andy Wood's a hardworking guy that deserves a crack at the big time. And believe me, he shares no responsibility for this incident. In fact, it might have been worse without his skills right there. Just a nice little barrel roll. The parachute getting tangled in the car and still doing its job, no matter where it may be. Incredible. Well, Andy Woods rebuilt that car and was back in competition before the 96 season was over. Now watch this. Shelly Anderson just smoked the tires in Seattle. Watch this in Brainerd up against Jim Head, the Smoking Joe's car. These cars are about balance if the front end gets light. You saw it happen to Scott Coletta, and that was almost the twin. The fuel tank is up front, and sometimes if you take too long to burn out in stage, you wear up some of that ballast off that front end, and that may have been what caused Shelly Anderson to suffer her first blowover. I want you to see how calm she is. Let's watch it from yet another angle. Should carry the front end about like that. No, oh, and right there, it came up so fast, Shelly was virtually defenseless. That was not like Scott Coletta maybe wanting to win the race too badly. She did not have much of a chance to react. She may have tried to grab the brake to bring it down and it failed. Well, all in all, this whole run was a pretty good failure. One thing that didn't fail, the safety systems NHRE requires on that automobile. Gotta see it again. A little higher angle. Ooh, she pedaled the car. It started to shake. It was when she got back in it that it came up. Mm -hmm. 
Shelley's really first major incident. She got out of the car, and I don't think her blood pressure or heart rate were up one little bit. Some kind of gal. Okay, from further down the racetrack. Right there, she pedals the car. It was when she got back in it. And look at the Air Force's shred, literally peel the magnesium bodywork off that car, not to mention crunch all the timing equipment. Shelly now in just a skeleton of an automobile. A $40,000 dragster chassis will be in the dumpster the day after. My back's a little sore, but that's okay. That's racing. Um, just shows how safe these cars are. And that's why NHRA has all the strict rules, um, safety rules, is just for this reason. Tell us a little bit about, do you, do you know exactly what happened to you when you were? Oh, yeah. I went out there, and it started to smoke and shake, and I just barely got out of it. And when I hit the throttle, all the clutch locked up, and the tires hooked, and over it went. I mean, I was there for the ride, and that's okay. I mean, you're going to go through them racing. Um, I'm fine, so it really, I mean, now I know what it feels like to really crash, and that's okay. Well, hopefully for Shelly, that's the last time we see the great big crash. Well, that's a wrap on And They Walked Away 5, and we end with a final video tribute to the men and women of the safety crews all over this great world of motorsports. The drivers wouldn't race without them. For Army Armstrong and Dave Reap, I'm Steve Evans saying, may they always walk away. And they walked away five. It's a production of Diamond P Sports. Want the best seat in the house for the hottest motorsports action? Then choose from over 40 spectacular titles in the Diamond P Motorsports Action Catalog. No collection is complete without the hottest selling action video series available anywhere. And they walked away. In all four And They Walked Away videos, you'll thrill to the awesome power of top fuel dragsters and funny cars unleashed and out of control. The chills and spills of motorcycles, speeding stock cars, and high-flying monster truck mayhem. You'll jump out of your chair with a nerve-tingling adventure of unlimited hydroplane racing included in that before. And in each bone-jarring incident, the driver walked away. Drag racing fans will recapture all the exciting moments of the season in Diamond P's Drag Racing Yearly Review. Relive each year of the blazing street landers from Drag 86 through Drag 95 as NHRA's top drivers compete for the coveted championship crown. Call the 24-hour hotline number on your screen and order from our special series of biographies on some of motorsports' most dominant legends like Drag Racing's undisputed record setter, Kenny Bernstein, the king of speed. You show me someone that enjoys losing, I'll show you someone that's never won. It's that simple. Meet the force behind the Liquid Oval's most prolific team, Bernie Little, Mr. Unlimited, and his quest to become Unlimited Hydroplane Racing's winningest team with the Miss Budweiser. And the nightmare continues with the man whose every pass down the track is nothing short of an amusement park thrill ride. John Force, still the one, is wall-to-wall -wall excitement as well as candid interviews. I have all the fear in the world. I have all the respect for this hot rod because it can hurt you. Still not full? Still craving more action? Then call the number on your screen and get the catalog. Inside, it's full of action videos including the Shake, Battle, and Roll series. The videos that will satisfy your need for gritty, roaring monster truck and mud racing drum, four-wheel and off-road jamboree excitement, and the exciting car-crushing monster truck thunder drag series. One more? You'll find that not every awesome fire, flip, and tumble is unexpected. In Joey Chitwood 50 Years of Thunder, 
you'll experience precision stunts and death-defying feats from the most legendary thrill show on wheels. If you're into speed and looking good, then you'll definitely want the best of Hot Rods 2, featuring some of the slickest, tricked-out speedsters, towering 4x4s and slamming and jamming high-performance workhorses, and of course, those thundering hogs. If you're looking to round out your drag racing package, don't miss 40 years of the U.S. Nationals, an in-depth look at the evolution of the sport and its heroes at one of drag racing's crown jewel events. For practical tips and 